be quite a shift, I think, from the nanobodies and antibodies and the fantastic work you've all been hearing about. Um, I work at the Brown School of Public Health on very, very different topics. And um, wanted to talk with you a little bit uh, about the unvaccinated, what we know about them, what we should know about them, and um, why I think we should reconsider the current blame culture that we're in. This invitation was triggered really by an op-ed that I wrote earlier this year that resulted in, in lots of thousands of email letters. Uh, it even started trending on, on Apple at some point. And the only reason I mention it is because it really hit a nerve. People felt blamed and they feel even more so now. They reached out with lots of questions and it's important for us to understand why this happens and what we need to know and why we need to be more granular when we think about the large or the, you know, the two large parts of the population currently that are not vaccinated and really why the United States is so behind in, in their efforts. We started, you know, with, with the most vaccines and, and now most developing countries have, have moved ahead of us. So our team at Brown does work at the intersection of a number of different fields, most importantly, healthcare and public health policy behavioral sciences, communication studies, social medicine, and digital humanities. And this talk today is informed by research I'm currently doing as a partner in the Equity First Vaccination Initiative. It's really a collective action project in five cities in the United States. It's a $20 million investment by the Rockefeller Foundation in community organizations serving mostly low-wage BIPOC individuals. In this project, we are studying both access and confidence and where these overlap. And I want to get us started with really the question on, you know, why aren't more people vaccinated? What we see is that the tide has turned and blaming the unvaccinated has become popular. They cost our healthcare system. We now see again over 1500 people dying every day from a very preventable disease at this point. Our healthcare workers are exhausted. And increasingly, we think about, you know, why are people with the selfish behavior just not making different choices? Well, there's a lot of reasons. And that's really what I want to talk about today. Um, and how, how we sometimes tend to jump to conclusions about why people aren't getting vaccinated and why we frame it as a behavioral issue when there are significant systems level drivers such as racism, historical trauma and inequities in healthcare access, uh, sorry, access to healthcare and healthcare quality. And as I will lay out, also inequities in access to quality information and information at this point is a structural barrier to vaccination as well. So to keep things interesting, I thought I'd walk us through this by looking at four common myths about vaccinations and the unvaccinated. First myth is vaccine hesitancy is a fixed mindset, which it is not, right? It exists on a spectrum ranging from, you know, immediate acceptance to uncertainty, to delay, to outright refusal. We hear a lot right now about the resistors, even though they only make up a small percentage. And the movement along the spectrum of hesitancy is dynamic. Individuals' views change based on numerous interconnected factors. Well, as Dwayne said this morning, we're capable of learning. So for the next couple of slides, I'll be using polling data from the Kaiser Family Foundation Vaccine Monitor. Uh, the Kaiser Family Foundation is really an essential resource in, um, uh, in in an environment where we don't have enough data, we don't have enough information, and we don't do enough research on, again, in, uh, access and, and vaccine confidence questions. Um, so the vaccine monitor is an important tool, but obviously all the common limitations of polling apply. And I just wanna say that ahead of time. What we see on this slide really is that there is movement. There is movement um, as more people have gotten vaccinated. Uh, this slide doesn't have the latest data. So currently 76% of Americans have gotten at least one shot, which means that in, in any of these categories of people who said they were gonna get a vaccine as soon as possible, they were gonna wait and see, they were only gonna get vaccinated if required, 
or they would definitely not get vaccinated. We see some movement here. And yes, we're even seeing some movement in those who said they were never going to get vaccinated. As this slide shows, or as this graph shows, we have at this point roughly vaccinated 50% of people who said in January they were going to wait and see. So there's another 50% out there, or 46. There's also, and that is really interesting, we have actually vaccinated a quarter of the people who in January said they will not get vaccinated or only if they'd be required. This again speaks to the fact that vaccine hesitancy is not a fixed mindset. Vaccination decisions are often deeply personal and they're often made through repeated considerations over time and they are obviously never one dimensional. In our research, we distinguish between structural and attitudinal barriers, although in the work, especially in our demonstration sites, we see that these categories often overlap and we need to rethink them a little bit. Vaccine hesitancy is not a great word. We can talk about vaccine deferral, we can talk about vaccine eligibility confusion, people believing that because of insurance coverage or immigration status, they don't have access to the vaccine, even though that's not true. It's still a very valid belief. Vaccine apathy can set in when things feel abstract or non-applicable to people. Myth number two is that most unvaccinated people are white Republicans. So the unvaccinated, also a terrible term, uh, are not a monolith. They're black and white, they're Hispanic, and they're diverse. And it is really important for us to understand that. For example, we see that 13% of the unvaccinated are Black, which corresponds with this group's share of the population. Hispanics make up about 16.7% of the population, but, uh, but they are 20% of the unvaccinated. So we're not meeting our equity goals here in vaccinating all populations equally. Now, the way these polls often get communicated is that we hear that more Republicans are unvaccinated than Democrats. As you can see here, that is true. Sorry, wrong arrow. <laughs> As you can see here, um, up here, that is true. 51% of those that are not yet vaccinated are Republican. But of course, it's not 70 or 80% as, the, as it sometimes seems to be. If we look at these numbers, we could say with the same confidence that the unvaccinated are suburbanites. So it's helpful and important to look with more granularity. And if we do that, we see that, for example, education levels play an important role, and so do income levels. It's also important to see that at least every fifth person who doesn't want to get vaccinated doesn't have health insurance. Which brings us to myth number three. Availability is not access and vaccines are not free and easily accessible for everybody everywhere to the same extent. We are, for example, learning in our demonstration sites that transportation remains still an issue, even though most people think that has been resolved. If you live in Houston, which is a city that does not have a proper functioning uh, public transportation system, even if a vaccination site is available within five miles of your home, as the current administration keeps pointing out, you're not going to walk two miles in the Houston heat to get a vaccine. That's just not going to happen. The social determinants of health, as we call them, they're really important in all of this. And in these communities, people are struggling and vaccination is really only one of many health needs that they're trying to meet. In Chicago, for example, the life expectancy gap between Blacks and non-Blacks is 9.2 years. About half of that is caused by chronic illness, which again is brought about by the side effects of poverty, education debt, unhealthy living conditions, substandard housing, community violence, lack of access to quality food, or low-paying stress-inducing jobs, and so forth. In three of the five cities that we're working in, Community organizations are actually uniting around these issues. In Chicago, it's the Chicagoland Vaccine Partnership. 
and CBOs are starting to work together to make transparent these structural issues and exchange notes on approaches to solutions and what works and what doesn't. So how exactly do the lived experiences of black and brown communities impact their vaccination intent? We did a study with the Rockefeller, or poll, I should say, um, with the Rockefeller Foundation, since I share, I'm sure there's some people here who have concerns about polling, and so do we, but it's, it's you know, one of the tools that we have in, in the toolkit as we deeply un try to understand behavior. Uh, so we did this um, poll with the Rockefeller Foundation earlier this year that was fielded in BIPOC populations in our five demonstration sites. And people were asked about their intent to get vaccinated, but we also asked them about their experiences with the healthcare system. And that helped us surface something that isn't usually or hadn't been asked for quite a while in, in these surveys, which is, turns out that one in five African Americans and Latino adult adults report that they're currently facing healthcare disparities and one in five do not regularly engage in healthcare. The survey also revealed that one in five people in these communities of color report they have trouble accessing care when they need it. We then found that those who had greater barriers accessing care or were more often treated with disrespect within the healthcare system were also less likely to express the intent to get vaccinated even after we accounted for gender, age, education, and insurance status. This relationship was even more pronounced for Black Americans, which may reflect additional unmeasured issues of structural racism beyond what we were able to look at in this project. We need a lot more work on these questions, but these findings underline that by just saying all oh, the vaccines are available, it does not mean that people can access them. And I'll give you one more example. It's often hard for those who have lived with the privilege of healthcare to understand what it is like to not have healthcare. But imagine if all your encounters with healthcare have ended up in large bills. On average, you know, almost 20% of emergency department visits result in at least one surprise bill. bill sorry. So within the experience of a lot of people, it is just not conceivable that healthcare can be free and that a vaccine can be free. Shifting gears a little bit to our final myth, quality information about vaccine is vaccines is readily available to everyone. This was the most puzzling to me um, as I got more involved in this work, as for a lot of us, information about vaccination, right? We know how to do Google searches. There's lots of media reporting. We know our sources online. Uh, there, there, there's a lot of information available. And yet another consistent driver of lack of vaccine confidence is that people don't have the same access to the same information. Instead, they're bombarded with false information. Remember that in our platform driven media ecosystem, no two people ever get the same information. Unlike in the past when, you know, one could go to a newsstand and select a magazine or some other reading and are pushed in front of you on social media based on data analytics that we can't influence much. This slide shows sort of one recent um, poll by the Pew Research Center on the how, how many people are getting their news on social media about COVID. But what we see from many different polls uh, on different topics is that now more Americans get their news from non-traditional news sources than from traditional news sources. And to be clear, Fox News is part of the traditional news sources here. So people increasingly um, get their information and the ways in which they make sense of anything really from social media. And I think as most of you know, we're observing multiple overlapping phenomena. Then um, as this all unfolds, politicians are sharing misleading or false information for political gain. Countries such as Russia and China are employing troll farms to flood these spaces with confusing information to create chaos. And people with ideological or financial interests are sharing false information for financial gain, 
such as those aiming to sell natural fuels. All of this means that we live in a polluted information environment with some more healthy spaces and some outright toxic spaces. And because people are constantly exposed to some people, I should say, this is not true for everybody, obviously, some people are constantly exposed to unhealthy and toxic information diets, they believe the misinformation, or they don't know anymore what's true and what's not true, as this um, graph I pulled again from the Kaiser Family Foundation vaccine tracker shows, and many others show as well. Why does this happen? because platforms are designed to drive engagement, which favors emotional content, and not to drive education or informing the public, which favors well-told but less arousing content. So by pointing out these structural concerns, I don't by any means want to take away responsibility from politicians and other bad faith actors, quite to the contrary, right, who use these mechanisms for their purpose. Um, but fighting misinformation and rebuilding trust in institutions and thus um, increasing access and confidence in vaccinations isn't an either or, it's really an all of the above. We want to distinguish between propaganda and political theater that we're seeing. We want to distinguish then between disinformation campaigns, which are distributed for the purpose of confusing people and misinformation that is inadvertently shared by regular people. The Digital Defense Leak created a report, the disinformation dozen, that does a terrific job at showing how a small number of bad faith actors abuses our current system, information ecosystem, I should say, to spread toxic information and harm and how it harms people and our collective ability to protect everyone with vaccines. So just to be sure again, I'm bringing all this up because I really believe from everything that we are seeing that the unvaccinated, <clears throat> sorry, that the American public is caught in the middle of all of this and needs support in navigating all the many confusing pandemic moments in a confusing information ecosystem. So I'll give you one last example from one of our sites, and please do not share this image. One issue we often have in, in mis and disinformation research is uh, that we do not uh, want to perpetuate uh, the, the images and the content, the, the misleading and false content that gets shared. At the same time, sometimes you just have to see it to understand it. Um, this is uh, disinformation about vaccination, particularly targeted at Black communities. It is not created by Black leaders, but it is targeted at Black identity and the, the Black concerns about historic abuses in the medical system. So these campaigns are very sophisticated and they are effective and we're currently working with the communities in which um, these messages are circulating on educating the public or really educating the communities about how they're being played and how others are trying to use their well-funded concerns for their own purposes. So does blaming work? It does not really. In conflating and problematizing really the spectrum of the many different people who have not at this point access vaccines, our authorities can further erode trust and confidence and they're really exacerbating rather than resolving the factors that underlie vaccine hesitancies. Blame and stigma harden people, people's positions, they further politicize the issue, they trigger defensiveness, they drive those with historic mistrust even further away, and then they increase the inequities because it becomes even harder for community leaders to build the trust and provide a sense of safety around vaccines. Another side effect of blaming is that by mainstreaming blaming the unvaccinated, we're also opening up the door for blaming minorities, as we see in this example from the lieutenant governor in Texas and many, many other examples. So my call to action is really that we want to reconceptualize blame. It's time for a critical reframing away from distrust and hesitance 
where the object of concern is the individual, towards issues of trustworthiness, where the object of concern are the public institutions and systems delivering the vaccinations and the vaccination messages. Structural barriers require structural changes and institutions need to assess their institutional responsibilities. We need dignity in healthcare and understand that how we treat people today impacts how we're able to respond in a crisis. Officials need to communicate directly to the people and not just through the media. Doctors, of course, are trying hard to talk directly with patients. And public health needs to learn the tools of 21st century communication in order to be effective. And I'll give you one, I'm going to finish with one last example for all of you who may or may not have caught the Nicki Minaj uproar over the last 48 hours. Um, here's an example for what not to do. Nicki Minaj has a whole backstory here about how she um, uh, uh, shared online some and on Twitter some misinformation. Um, but uh, we, we saw a lot of scientists blaming her uh, and becoming snarky about, you know, you have your own team of scientists and so forth. Uh, it's really not a great way to engage with those who have concerns about vaccines or might inadvertently sh share misinformation. And Kizzy, of course, showed us all how to do it by engaging, by putting out an invitation and providing access to um, uh, a lot of helpful information. So just to be sure, yes, I'm not an anti-vaxxer, I am vaccinated, but I want us to also better understand the unvaccinated so that we can find solutions and, and so that we can get more people vaccinated. And this is our team. And thank you all for listening and I look forward to questions. Excellent, thank you, Stephanie. Um, I'm sure lots of hands will will pop up soon. Um, I do. I, I have a couple of questions actually. When when you talk about the four myths associated with vaccine hesitancy, one of the sort of things that jumped into my head was myth number two, in picturing an unvaccinated person as a white Republican sort of ranting at a TV screen somewhere. Right. That's sort of what I have in my own mind. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just curious, to what extent is that, and perhaps the other stereotypes as well against the unvaccinated, to what extent is that being reinforced by, um, I guess, the mainstream media? I'm not sure what else to call it. Yeah, it's a really, it's a great question. And I'm glad the myths are resonating. I wasn't sure exactly, <laughs> right? We all have different myths in our minds. So. Um, uh, it is a fascinating combination of how we read polls, which is, it is statistically a majority, right? But by focusing on that, we don't see that there's another 40% of other people, or 47% in this, wherever we land with the exact numbers, right? So then the polls get reported, or get the readout this way, and then the media picks up on it and does the background story. There's obviously also like this all happens in the larger context of the significant politicization. And um, I think we're, we're very clearly in a moment where um, the president has chosen to, um, to uh, uh, acknowledge and express the anger that parts of the population are feeling about those that are not getting vaccinated. So that is now sort of being I'm using the word mainstreamed, right? It's it's now okay to be mad at the unvaccinated. Um, uh, there's some some political calculation in there. However, it it will certainly not help us solve the problem, and it will not make anybody who hasn't gotten vaccinated yet any more likely to get vaccinated. Um, and and that is clearly like what the science shows. But it's a combination of the politics. The, the how we report on polling and then how the, the the media machinery picks up right whatever the lead was from the polling company and, and creates another story about another republican who's against it and those are not false right this is about yeah. contextualizing but I, so i i haven't looked at the latest um data saying how many people have been vaccinated per day i know we were 
sort of consistently around 800,000 per day for a long time, um, which to me doesn't seem that bad. Um, I, I realize the, the infections are, are sort of raging in places, but do we have to sort of say that giving 800,000 vaccinations per day in the U.S. is is not as bad as perhaps we're making it out to be? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think we see. So what we hear from communities of color is you have to give us time. Don't push us. You have to give us time. We understand this is important, but it is just really, really hard to get there. And what any and myself included, any public health expert will say is, but 1500 people are dying every day. Like we cannot overlook this, right? So the, the question um, that is at play here is um, having to prioritize long-term trust versus short-term saving lives. That is sort of the brutal reality that is playing out in these communities as public health officials push really hard for vaccine mandates and, and vaccinations and communities are saying, we're not gonna go there. And this is sort of related. Can you comment on the, the fraction of the population that would qualify as vaccine hesitant um, versus the fraction of population that is vaccinated against some other disease. So the MMR vaccine that we get as children and things like this. Is there a discrepancy there or are they sort of paralleling one another? So the, in the resistor group, um, we also see lower numbers of prior vaccinations. So those that are saying, I will definitely not get vaccinated. They have a higher number of the, the so-called movable middle, right? So um, the people who are in the wait and see category or even in the only if required, because that's a very malleable category too. Um, uh, we, we don't see like, uh, how, you know, we don't see any significant like uh, lack of prior vaccination. However, we do see in parents that uh, parents who are um, indicating that they would not want their children to get vaccinated for COVID um, against COVID uh, also have skipped prior vaccination in their children. Okay, well, we have a question from Adrian Bruger, who I'd like Adrian to raise his hand and ask the question. Um, and in the meantime, um, Stuart Firestein has a question. Ah, Adrian's hand is up too. So Stuart, why don't you um, take the floor? the floor? Thanks. Thank you for that excellent presentation. It's very important to see the granularity in this. I, I'd just like to speculate a bit or ask you to speculate a bit on what the future um, uh, knock on uh, uh, ramifications of this might be. I, I have the feeling that there's a kind of a the beginnings of a self-fulfilling prophecy at hand here where communities who maybe rightfully or, or, or rightfully have reason to mistrust big government, uh, biomedical establishment, uh, big pharma, et cetera, et cetera, are refusing the vaccine and then will get sick. These communities will have a higher rate of sickness and then there'll be in the future yet another reason to blame, um, to blame all of these institutions and to blame sort of uh, you know this this structural these structural problems you, you know what i mean that this is somehow or another i worry that the result of all this will just uh, be one more mark uh, in the long line of this and the next time we're in this situation we'll be even worse off you see that as a possibility stuart there's some yeah okay perfect thank you stuart that's an excellent question yes i do see that as a possibility more so though in conservative circles than in communities of color, because they're already disproportionately affected by the pandemic. And um, again, especially for these low wage populations, the you know, COVID can just get in line with all the other health issues and, and um, uh, pressing sort of needs that people are trying to meet every day. 
but I, in general, I definitely agree with the notion that this is a, a risk or something we need to be aware of. Okay, and, and um, Adrian Bruger. Yes, they, uh, thank you very much, first of all, for this fantastic presentation. Uh, it's, it's very enlightening. Um, I, I actually had a question uh, sort of taking into account, say, sort of the Fox News, so the center right, uh, the, the more moderate uh, conservative circles, which tend to reiterate personal responsibility as the key to fighting this pandemic. So what are your thoughts on you know, companies such as, for example, Delta Airlines instituting a $200 health surcharge for those who are not vaccinated, uh, which is just you know, a direct consequence to a free choice that an employee at Delta may make to not be vaccinated, but they do cause higher health costs and potentially damage the company and their peers. So uh, what are your thoughts on sort of this more moderate but economic uh, tool? Yeah, thank you. Also a fantastic question. We're seeing, right, a number of proposals like this, um, including, you know, um, raising insurance fees for unvaccinated or providing benefits to the vaccinated. Um, I honestly think that we are in a an uncontrolled large experiment and that at this point all of these are to some extent valid approaches to try out but we don't know how they will play out and another um place where this plays out for example right now is um i don't know how aware everybody is that in the healthcare sector right a lot of staff and, and nurses are not vaccinated um uh, nursing homes the same and um by putting in right by the administration try to the, the effect had been that um, if, a, if a hospital puts in a vaccination mandate, we have a vaccination mandate tracker, I can link that in a second, the hospital puts in a mandate, um, then those staff will leave and go somewhere else, they can travel nurse, right, there's money to be made elsewhere. But now we will have, because effectively everybody who receives Medicare or Medicaid funding, which is 100% of hospitals in the country, uh, we effectively have vaccine mandates in all hospitals, that will create a different environment in which people have to choose if they stay in nursing or not or go work for some small company. Um, so, and, and a lot more than previously thought are actually leaving and health and, and hospitals are experiencing shortages. So that's just one example. I, I don't have a specific comment about this Delta. It's obviously Delta's prerogative to do this and it will be a very interesting experiment to see how people are responding. It depends on, right, as long as there are other airlines I can fly with, it doesn't apply to me. So um, there's a lot of considerations and I see think we will see a lot of experimentation with this. Um, I do think that these are a lot better than blaming. These are very practical matters, right? So mo most of my, my of what I hope I'm leaving everybody with is just to think about how we talk about it. And that has a huge impact on the success of any of these measures. <laughs> 